Good morning and welcome to the first week of our new six-week message series. I am so excited about this new series because it's one that we're going to think through together. Rather than trying to tell you that we have all the answers, we're going to be asking you for ongoing input, your thoughts and your experiences. I'll tell you more about that later. Another thing that I love about this series is the title. We're calling it Snakes and Doves. Clever Christianity, Blameless Believers. Now, I'm sure you just had an immediate gut reaction to the title of this series. I did too. It may have even given you the creeps. I mean, the, the dove part sounds okay, right? Everybody loves doves. A few years ago, back in my old, old church, we even released doves on Pentecost Sunday after Mass. It was a huge hit. After all, doves are very gentle creatures with the soothing presence and the calming clucks and coos that they have. The dove is a universal symbol of both love and peace. But what about the snake? What about the snake part? I don't really know any people who actually enjoy the sight of a snake, although a few insane people keep them as pets. If you're like me, you would practically jump out of your skin, pardon the pun, if you saw one of those forked tongues slithering cold-blooded reptiles up close, right? They're okay in the zoo, but not out of a cage. In contrast to the dove, the serpent is a symbol of evil especially in Christianity. So snakes and doves. Doves good, snakes bad. But that makes it all the more curious what Jesus said to his apostles in Matthew chapter 10 when he sent them out to towns and villages. Very strange thing he said. Here's what he said. Jesus told them, Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. Over the next six weeks, we're going to be unpacking that little bit of wisdom together, you and I. It's really about how to survive in a changing and a confusing world. And by the way, if you don't consider yourself a church person or a religious person and you happen to be tuning in to this series, we could actually use your help because, you know, we religious types tend to isolate ourselves from the world sometimes and from all the realities in the world. So we'd love to hear your perspective about it all, how we can be a Christian in today's world. You know, I was chatting with one of our staff members the other day. We were working together in setting up some live streaming equipment in the church so that we could broadcast our Sunday services online. And at one point, he turned to me and he said, you know, I feel like we're just like the first apostles, trying to figure out how to communicate the message of Jesus. It was a remarkably accurate point of view. Because in these strange days, we actually are pioneers again. Church is changing. We're living in unprecedented times. Atheism is on the rise. Secular institutions increasingly marginalize religious beliefs. The majority of young people claim no religious affiliation. And to make matters worse, most people today remain isolated in their homes, afraid of genuine human contact. So now, more than ever, modern-day disciples need to find creative and clever ways to advance the kingdom. And that, according to Jesus, requires the craftiness of a serpent and the gentleness of a dove. You know, Jesus himself was quite dove-like. We all know, I hope, that Jesus was gentle and compassionate towards the poor. He welcomed the outcast and dined with sinners and invited the marginalized into his community. He healed the sick and laid hands on lepers and other people that were deemed unclean by the religious authorities of his day. 
He was gentle. And he didn't trample on the rights of others or crush their spirit. He, he did not establish his dominion by violence or aggression or fear, but through humility and the meekness of his own character. He taught people to love their enemies and pray for their persecutors. He lived a holy life without sin, and he publicly challenged anyone to find fault with him. And three times, even the Roman pure procurator procurator Pontius Pilate found Jesus to be an innocent man. So he was gentle like a dove. But he was also very clever in the way he taught and handled people. He told stories that ordinary folks could relate to and understand. He was fierce in debates with his religious opponents, and he always gained the upper hand and had the last word. In story after story, he avoided the many traps that his enemies laid for him and was able to elude the authorities, trying to arrest him and put him to death until the time had come, the, the right time had come. So Jesus was also very clever. So how do we strike a balance like that? A balance between serpent and dove. How can we be gentle without becoming pushovers, humble servants, but not unnecessary martyrs? How can we act shrewdly in a tough and demanding world without compromising our values? Clever Christians anticipating and responding to threats and finding ways to survive, but not Machiavellian strategists with impure motives. How do we find the right approach? For the last three years of high school, when I was growing up, I, I transferred from a very prestigious college preparatory school in Atlanta, Georgia, to a redneck high school in backwoods Smyrna, Georgia. It couldn't have been a bigger change. It's a long story. Anyway, every day I took the big yellow school bus, and every day in the back of the bus sat an enormous guy named Michael Hawkins. And we all cringed when he got on the bus. See, Michael was an evangelical Christian, and he would preach the gospel every day all the way to school to the other students. And when he was finished, he would make the rounds through the aisles of the bus, asking each of us whether we had accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Most of the students never challenged him, probably because of his size. They would just sit quietly and keep their heads down and just endure the uncomfortable situation, trying their best to ignore him. But on occasion, his pushiness would provoke an angry outburst and, and one time, even a physical altercation, I remember. You see, his aggressive sales tactics were obnoxious and, quite frankly, a turnoff. I mean, if Jesus wasn't on my radar before, Michael's forceful approach would have made me even less interested. I think we can safely say that Michael's line of attack was counterproductive, to say the least. It was too much snake and not enough dove. At the other end of the spectrum, however, is what most believers do. The default position of most people who call themselves followers of Christ is to remain silent. They would rather blend in with the crowd, stay hidden from view, and remain in the background. This form of anonymous Christianity is, well, it's entirely understandable. We all want to be tolerant, right, and respectful of the opinions of others. And saying nothing usually avoids confrontation and keeps the peace, which is a good thing. But this dove-forward approach well, which is really no approach at all, 
unfortunately selfishly withholds any message of hope or truth to those living in a confusing world who may really need to hear it. And to be honest, you know, it's much easier to retreat into the relative safety of pious prayer than to actually speak up. I mean, why do any heavy lifting yourself when you can just pass the buck to God? Well, to answer that question and, and maybe to begin finding a happy snake dove balance, let's take a look at the gospel passage for today. It's a familiar story. It's retold in all four gospels. Jesus had just received news of the death of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was a, was a close friend and a relative of Jesus's. And I suppose wanting to grieve alone, Jesus went off to a deserted place, but when he saw this huge crowd following him, his heart was moved with compassion, and he took the time to heal all the sick people who had come to him. He gave up his quiet time for the people who needed him. After all, I just finished telling you that Jesus was gentle like a dove, right? Well, at the end of a long day, everyone was hungry and tired. But they were, they were a long way from food, so his disciples told him to send the people away to buy food for themselves. But then Jesus did something very, very clever. He said to his disciples, there is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. Well, the disciples were sort of astounded. They didn't know what to say or do. They said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. See, the disciples noticed the people's hunger, but they didn't take responsibility for it. They didn't try to figure out a solution. They weren't creative because they just didn't think they had the resources to provide it themselves. They didn't think out of the box. And Jesus was teaching them a lesson on clever Christianity. So Jesus himself performed one last act of kindness on that day. He multiplied the small provisions into enough food to feed thousands of people so that they wouldn't have to worry about traveling home on an empty stomach. And just in case the disciples didn't get the point that it was their responsibility to come up with solutions, Jesus when he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, he told them to go out and give the bread and the fish to the people. Jesus didn't just give it to the people himself, he gave it to the disciples to give to the people. A clever way of demonstrating that it's their responsibility to think creatively what a clever strategy Jesus had. See, from the very beginning, God has delegated control over the earth to us, to humankind. As a species, we have been given the awesome responsibility and, and privilege of taking ownership of our terrestrial habitat. At the dawn of creation, the Bible says that God created man in his image. And then when he had created them, he said to them, be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. And then the Lord God took the man and woman and settled them in the Garden of Eden. To do what? To cultivate and to care for it. That's Genesis chapter 2. See, we have been charged with the complex and delicate task of stewarding the Earth's resources and ensuring a fair distribution of the world's goods. As one of the Psalms in the Bible, Psalm 8, puts it, the Lord made man little less than a God, crowned him with glory and honor, and gave him rule over the works of his hands, put all things at his feet. See, we're kind of in charge as stewards for God. God owns everything, but has given us the responsibility. You know, throughout human history, God has made a way for his people, but the people had to follow that way. They had a responsibility too. A long time ago, the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt by a miracle, but then they had to make the long journey through the desert. 
They were led into the promised land, but then they had to put their hands to the plow and cultivate it. They were given a code to live by, but it was their challenge to observe it. They were given a nation and a government and a line of kings, but they were the ones who had to be governed for better or worse. When their nation crumbled because of their infidelity to God and they were led into captivity by foreign powers, God brought them back and he made a way again. That's what we heard in the first reading. All you who are thirsty, come to the water. You who have no money, come, buy grain and eat. These are the words of God from calling his people back from exile after a hundred years. God made a way again, but once they were home, the difficult task of restoring their land, rebuilding their civilization, and reinvigorating the Jewish culture fell on their shoulders. It was up to them to seize the opportunity and become a great nation once again, a model of holiness for the world. And when they ultimately fell far short of that goal, God sent humanity in the fullness of time, a once and for all savior, and lifted him up on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. God made a way yet again with Jesus Christ. But the hard work of building the kingdom on earth remains ours. Today, we face unprecedented challenges. God continues to make a way through all of it, I believe, but his command is the same today as it was yesterday. Give them some food yourselves. We can conjure up many excuses for not taking ownership, for abdicating responsibility. Oh, there isn't enough for everyone. The problems are too big. Our resources are too small. What can we do? We don't know where to begin. Lots of excuses. But the charge is still ours. We are responsible for protecting the elderly and the vulnerable during this pandemic. We are responsible for ending racism and redressing the historic disadvantages carried over from slavery. We are responsible for overcoming our differences and working together to rebuild the economy. We are responsible for protecting the environment, feeding the hungry, lifting up the poor, saving the unborn, accompanying the lonely, comforting the brokenhearted, addressing crime, creating the conditions for a peaceful existence among the nations, and working for social justice, and just a better world overall. All of this has been delegated to us. Give them some food yourselves, Jesus says. And you and I, we cannot abdicate that responsibility, nor can we be ineffective in carrying it out and still call ourselves the people of God. Clever Christianity demands that we produce fruit by our resourcefulness and ingenuity, while it's at the same time doing no harm and acting with gentleness and kindness. That's what this series is all about, is discovering what that really means for us today. And so we have three challenges for you during this series. The first one is to commit to the series. Commit to all six weeks, tune in every week, and if you miss an episode, if you're away in Tahoe or whatever, go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. You can get access to our YouTube channel through our website, www.sthillary.org. Second, we want you to sign up for our electronic newsletter called Flocknote. And you can do that right on the home page of our website. Every week, we're going to send you some questions to reflect on that can help you become both wiser in, in living out your faith and more holy at the same time. So pay attention to those questions. Think about them. Spend time with them. Talk about it, about those questions with your family and friends, and ask God to lead you forward. And then the last challenge for this series is to send in your stories. As I said at the beginning of my message, we want you to participate in this series, helping us figure out how we can be clever Christians and blameless believers. If the world has challenged you somehow in living out your faith, if you found ways to be clever 
in dealing with the things of this world or the people of this world, we'd love to hear about it. In fact, we've set up a special section on our website just for that purpose. This fall, we're going to begin a year of reflection as a parish on, on how we can become a greater catalyst for connection in our world. We're going to try to do what we can to bring people together. Don't we need that so much right now? I can't think of a more timely topic, and also one that will require clever and creative approaches. You may ask how one parish could ever make a dent in solving the world's problems. And trust me, we don't have all the answers. In fact, we don't have many. But maybe, just maybe, I think, it may have something to do with becoming as clever as snakes and innocent as doves. <laughs>